Hey, I think it's uh, Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, that means only one thing if you're tuning in on the Rom Toronto Instagram account. That means it's the Rom Kids Show. Uh, nice to see you all here. Very exciting episode. Uh, for those that are uh, brand new, uh, for the next roughly 30 minutes, uh, we are going to do an art project on our show. We're going to talk to uh, one of my good friends, Dr. David Evans, paleontologist at the Royal Ontario Museum. And we're going to chat all about dinosaurs. Uh, this is a kid's show. Um, if you're an adult and you want to like hang out and talk dinosaurs with us, throw those questions right into the group chat right there. Um, to all the teachers, put the questions right into the group chat from your, uh, from your classmates, your students, to everyone at home. Welcome to ours. It's the Wrong Kids Show. Very excited to have you here. Uh, all our episodes are also up on YouTube. Uh, last week's episode with educator and science communicator Julie Tomei, All About the Moon, is up on YouTube right now. Uh, and, this, and today's episode will go up later this week. Uh, next week on the show, another good friend of ours, um, Oliver Hadrath, is on to talk about DNA. And we're going to do our own DNA experiment with strawberries to extract uh, some DNA from some fruit at home. Um, with that said, I think I'm ready to do the theme song portion of the event, and then we're going to get started. So, uh, here we go. It's Tuesday. It's two. It's the Wrong Kids Show. Welcome to the Wrong Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the Wrong Kids Show. Starring you, you, and me. There we go. Um, so excited to have you all here. Um, I hope you're wearing your dinosaur-themed clothing. I'm wearing my... Oh, Mylon's here. Hey, Mylon, what's going on, friend? Um, it, I'm wearing several items of dinosaur-themed clothing today. I got my Zool socks, which you can't really see, but trust me, they're there. And I'm wearing uh, my camp sweater backwards so that you can see this beautiful dinosaur art made by Ron Kid's former camper and now assistant, Henry Sharp, also an incredible science uh, artist. Uh, let's get together and talk about dinosaurs. Remy says hi. Hey, Remy, what's going on, friend? Um, so many friends with us today, all to talk about dinosaurs uh, with David Evans, and we'll get to him in a second. What we are doing today on the show, Noah's here. Hi, Noah, what's going on? I hear you're wearing a dinosaur shirt as well. Very exciting for all of us. Um, today, we are making uh, dinosaur silhouettes. Uh, I'm very excited for this. Um, uh, it's like, we're gonna learn about gradients. We're gonna learn about silhouettes today. Uh, have some fun painting. Uh, and then, of course, next week, it's an experiment. So, you know, we like to switch things up a bit. So what do you need to grab from your household or from your classroom or from your desk right now? Um, you are gonna need some paper, uh, a light piece of paper. We're out of white paper at our household, so we're using this like nice manila. Um, you're gonna need some black construction paper. Um, here's a slice of black construction paper. All right, just grab some of that. Oh, Maggie, Allison, Owen, some dinosaur lovers also hanging out with us today. Nice and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Wrong Kid Show. Uh, what else are you gonna need? You're gonna need some scissors to do your cutting. Uh, you're gonna need some glue to do your gluing, uh, a brush and some water to do your painting, and some paint. Uh, today we are using watercolors because I think watercolors blend really nicely together. Um, so, you know, figure out what you have at home, grab all those things. Oh yeah, I'm not even done yet. You're also gonna need a light pencil crayon. Um, we lost our white pencil crayon, so we're using, again, this sort of like beige color one, uh, so that we can draw on our silhouettes to get um, our silhouettes from our work. And hi from Brazil, welcome. Um, okay, so with that said, while you're gathering all your materials, um, let's welcome to the show uh, a frequent guest and good friend, Dr. David Evans, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kieran. great to be here. Uh, that's so exciting. Also, look at that right there, another dinosaur shirt. So we're all on theme together. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. We are gonna talk a lot today about uh, things to get excited about for dinosaurs in the upcoming year. 
Yeah, some dino New Year's resolutions. What do I hope happens in the world of dinosaur discoveries in 2021? I can't wait. Um, very quickly, we're going to do our first step, okay? Our first step to our art project, uh, and then we're going to get into it. So today we need to make a gradient. That's what's going to be your background. And um, a gradient essentially is uh, colors that transition or change into other colors. And so because there's lots of steps to this, I've already started this project, but I'm just gonna show um, our friends at home how to do uh, sort of some blending, okay? And now we're gonna talk about some dinosaurs. So I'm going over to like my art palette, my paint palette, and I'm gonna take a color that's lighter than my orange because I want it to transition to yellow. It's sort of like a nice little sunset, if you will. That's what I'm sort of going for here. A nice gradient of a sunset. So if you look at night on a really beautiful evening, you can see that beautiful sunset. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my brush, put it into my orange, make sure I get it going nice and good right there. And then I'm just gonna brush right along the bottom, okay? And what I can do, and just hold with me here until, and we're gonna get some dinosaur content in a little bit is I'm just putting it right along the bottom and then I'm even gonna go back to my red that I was using and I'm gonna do it sort of right over top. And that sort of creates that transition. And you'll see as we go through, I started with the blue uh, and then I added some purple and then I put some blue on top so it transi transitions into each other and we get that nice gradient. I'm gonna do it live for us right now. You try that out at home. Remember, you're taking one color and you're transitioning it, you're blending it into the other. Um, but while we're doing this, um, we are talking a little bit about environments here. Uh, David, there were dinosaurs all over the world, but what kind of like environments did dinosaurs live in? Yeah, well, one of the cool things about dinosaurs is that when they evolved somewhere around 240 million years ago, all the continents were together in a single supercontinent called Pangaea. So you could walk from the South Pole all the way to the North Pole, essentially, and you could walk to every corner of the globe. So when dinosaurs first took hold, they spread out to every corner of the globe, which means they basically occupied every environment um, that there was on the, on the planet, on land, um, throughout the entire reign of dinosaurs. Now, the overall climate was a lot different than it is today, and it changed a lot during the time of time of dinosaurs. Um, it, there were no permanent ice caps on the planet throughout their entire, yeah, 150-ish uh, million years of the Mesozoic, uh, which means that the whole world was a lot warmer. Um, today, the average global temperature is somewhere around 13 degrees. And back then, um, when, say, T-Rex lived or when our friend Parasaurolophus lived, uh, it was somewhere around, you know, 5 to maybe 10 degrees warmer, somewhere around 18 to 20 degrees. So that's quite a bit warmer. That said, uh, at that same time when T-Rex was around, um, the poles, they uh, didn't get as much sunlight, uh, particularly in the wintertime, and uh, they were much colder. And there's even some evidence that uh, it snowed on some dinosaurs. Whoa. That it could reach below freezing. So basically, you could almost, yeah, create a single scene um, that looked more or less however you wanted it to look, depending on what dinosaurs you put in and where they're from. But so lots of environments they lived in. They were a very adaptable group. Um, okay, I want to get back to that real quick, but there you can see sort of my gradient going on. I put the orange down and then I put the yellow sort of right on top. So it transitions into each other. And when it's still a little bit wet, the colors sort of blend even nicer. Um, David, so you're telling me that dinosaurs lived in like the North and South Pole? Yeah, yeah, as far as, as, far as they could get. Um, as close as land was to those points on the globe, they could get. Uh, and we even have d evidence that dinosaurs, you know, overwintered in the permanent darkness of the Arctic at the end of the age of dinosaurs, which was pretty neat. They had babies up there, um, you know, wow. eggshell fossils. So, you know, they could, they could tolerate a lot of different types of environments. We have dinosaur fossils from basically deserts. We have dinosaur fossils from upland sort of mountainous type environments. And of course, we have them from, you know, subtropical you know, lowland uh, environments, which is, I think, what we typically think of when we think of dinosaurs. But they really inhabited, you know, 
a, quite a wide variety of, of, of environments. I think what's really important here is for everyone to like realize that dinosaurs were around for a really long time. Yes. And which allowed them to have so many different forms and get to so many different places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you know, the climate changed a lot during their, during their reign and uh, you know, and they, they adapted. Uh, dinosaurs came in all shapes and sizes. We know from some of these discoveries that they weren't just scaly like reptiles, that a lot of the meat-eating dinosaurs anyways were covered in f- some type of feathery insulation. And so they could they could tolerate tolerate quite a bit of, uh, of variation wherever they lived. Um, Mylan has a really good question in the group chat, and it's about DNA. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, okay? So stick with us because we have a whole section on that, Mylan. Um, okay, my final question um, about environments, because as we make our little silhouettes here, you're going to want to make your, your silhouetted trees and things like that. Um, were there like flowers during the time of dinosaurs? Like, was it the same type of vegetation that we see today? Ooh, wow. Just, it's a really good question because that really impacts on the types of environments we draw the dinosaurs in or paint the dinosaurs in. Um, just like dinosaurs evolved greatly over that uh, over the entire Mesozoic, uh, so did plants. And actually the landscape in terms of, of botany changed quite a bit um, over the, the, the reign of the dinosaurs. Um, for most of the reign of dinosaurs through the Triassic and the Jurassic, there were no flowering plants. Huh. So there were no flowers. Uh, the landscape was dominated by more, more, uh, by more primitive types of plants, uh, conifers, other types of gymnosperms, uh, ferns, horsetails, um, these type of things, um, redwoods, uh, and these are a lot of these are familiar to us today. But uh, when flowering plants evolved, that changed the world forever. Mm-hmm. And there's even this idea that dinosaurs, with their intensive grazing, may have even invented flowers, put pressure on on um, uh, on on these ecosystems to change. Because uh, shortly after the end of the Jurassic which is the time of the great sauropods, which were just basically, you know, huge eating machines. Mm-hmm. Um, you had uh, flowers appear in the fossil record, or at least pollen of flowers, uh, which was the first, some of the oldest evidence of, of, of angiosperm pollen is uh, about 135 million years ago. So it's very shortly after um, these, the time of the great sauropods. Um, there, there hasn't been a really good, there hasn't been really good evidence to support that in recent years, but it's certainly an idea that's, that's out there. Uh, another one uh, that I think we see a lot today, uh, and that dinosaurs mistakenly get sort of put amongst, uh, is what we see on our front lawns, mm. uh, is grasses. And uh, grass is a type of angiosperm, it's a special type of flowering plant. Uh, that is an evolutionary latecomer to the age of dinosaurs. Uh, we really don't see widespread grasses until the very end of the age of dinosaurs, and that fossil record seems to be pretty limited to the southern continents. Um, so for most of their reign, you know, if you have a Stegosaurus or you know even a, a Parasaurolophus, um, you know, it's not walking around in a grassy savanna like you know we see. You know, animals in Africa doing today, or the bison on the on the prairies. Um, they the, the 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 shrubbery on the ground. Angiosperms would have dominated, but it would have been sort of shrubby, scrubby angiosperms at the time of say Par- Parasaurolophus, mm-hmm. and not a lot of grasses, as far as we can tell. So that's that came after the extinction. That's so interesting because like we see grass everywhere, and in my brain, it's like gr- grass was always around, but no, it wasn't. So that, that, that's really interesting. We have one final question related to climate and then we're gonna dive into some sure. resolutions. This is coming from the group chat. And this one's an easy one, but a really interesting one. A lot of Canada is like really cold today, but during the time of dinosaurs, dinosaurs were still wandering around Canada, right? Yeah, they were, yep. No, we have fossil evidence of dinosaurs from the, uh, the Maritimes, which placed them in Canada uh, about 200 million years ago. So. Uh, certainly they were around here before that. So they were in Canada during the Triassic, the Jurassic, and of course the Cretaceous is where our best fossil record of dinosaurs comes from. Uh, and, uh, we have dinosaurs from the East coast, from the West coast, uh, cool new dinosaurs coming out of, uh, of British Columbia. And then we also have, uh, 
dinosaur remains uh, from the Arctic. So they were really widespread across all of Canada, probably throughout the entire reign of the dinosaurs. Uh, we are having a lot of fun in the group chat finding out that flowers didn't exist back then or for much of the time of dinosaurs. So we are much learning the... so much today already. When T-Rex was around, there would have been flowers. But, yeah. during but the... when Stegosaurus, no, it would have been a much drabber world. So much, like science changes so much over time. There's so much evolution um, that took place over the time of dinosaurs. Remy asked where in Canada and, and the answer is dinosaurs were all over Canada. And we're going to talk very soon about dinosaurs in Ontario. But yeah. first, but first, before we get there, we get to Mylon's question as well. Um, we are talking a little bit about things that happened that we I think might happen to dinosaurs and we might learn about dinosaurs in 2021. Um, you were involved in a really big study last year. A study is like a time where we learn about something where scientists release a document that shows everything that they learned about. Um, and it was about how dinosaurs had cancer. Yes. And so, so we I talked a little bit about that last time, right? So here's actually the cancerous shin bone of the poor Centrosaurus. This is that cancerous bony tumor. Um, and yeah, this is a very important specimen that allowed us to diagnose definitively that dinosaurs got cancer for the very first time. So it was a very fun study to be a part of. It's fascinating because I think we often feel like we learn a lot about cancer maybe in our families and things like that, but also dinosaurs had cancer too. Do we, is there anything upcoming this year about where we might uh, learn something about health from dinosaurs? Yeah, our New Year's resolutions, right? We're talking about dinosaurs, New Year's resolutions. Often New Year's resolutions are related to eating healthier or getting outside more or exercising, you know, which is, which is good, especially given the last, you know, we've been indoors a lot um over the last year um i don't have any specific examples but we did release a new study just a few weeks ago led by my friend and uh, colleague philip bertazzo um, from europe about the basically the injuries and diseases that our good friend the rom parasaurolophus had uh, we did a thorough study of just you know what injuries and diseases this particular individual had the one in our gallery and it was it had a very very rough life it had a bunch of broken ribs it had a very traumatic injury to um, its spine over its shoulders um, one of the more interesting ones that hadn't been reported before but I noticed when I was working on my thesis is it had a, an abscess in its jaw so it had an infection or something uh, in its jaw that would have affected its teeth when it chewed so this would not have been very comfortable eating this particular di uh, individual dinosaur. It had seen a lot in its life. Um, and it gives you an idea of, you know, um, these types of injuries and how they heal can give us an idea of how these dinosaurs lived. And a lot of them lived pretty tough lives. What's really interesting is that we were able to learn about a dinosaur's life through their bones. We can see to your point about like, it had a tough life, it got around. We also can see that it lived, you know, a little bit later. Uh, yep. had, had lived a life and through its life, it had, you know, maybe some incidents with some other dinosaurs. Um, and that thing about the abseth tooth, you know, what's interesting too, is we have another very famous uh, part of our collection at the ROM is Jedmatazonk, which is a mummy, which also had a tooth problem too. So, you know, right. science can tell us a lot about prehistoric lives. Um, and the evolution of different diseases. So that was a cool that was a cool lesson we got from our dinosaur cancer paper is that bone cancer manifests in dinosaurs in the same way that it that it does in humans. Mm -hmm. So that was exciting. So yeah, there's a lot we can learn about the evolution of diseases uh, from studying the fossil record and studying their impact on bones. Uh, that is actually pretty difficult because studying diseases is pretty hard. A lot, a lot of them are limited to soft tissues, for instance. So yeah, it's a we can learn a lot of lessons so i'm sure there's lots to come i know there's many people doing research in this area um uh, so yeah the dinosaurs hopefully will learn more about their health status as well uh we're gonna know we're gonna get to your question about famous dinosaurs in toronto a little bit later in the show um but the next thing that we want to talk about in our resolutions is about dinosaur babies now if you go on youtube Ooh. you can find our first episode of season two together where we made some fizzing dinosaur eggs, which is a really fun activity for you to do at home. Um, 
but we're hoping to learn a little bit about dinosaur babies this year, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if, if you were giving, you know, we talked about New Year's resolutions and I thought that might be fun to talk about what I hope we find. We don't know if we're going to find this, but I, what I hope will be discovered. And I think um, what uh, a lot of people are surprised at is how little we know about some of the most famous dinosaurs. There's still so much to learn. There is careers and careers and careers for all of you future paleontologists out there. You don't have to worry. We have so much to learn. We'll never know it all. Um, and some of the things that I would like to see found um, include some babies of very famous types of dinosaurs that you might be surprised to know we basically know nothing about. One of those famous dinosaurs is Tyrannosaurus rex. So this is a rock from the spot where the very first T-Rex was collected in 1902. I got to visit that quarry a couple of years ago um, to the very hole in the ground where the first T-Rex was collected. It's now on display in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Museum. Uh, and of course, T-Rex is famous for being the biggest meat-eating dinosaur and the biggest land predator ever to evolve. This is a single tooth, Kieran. That's huge. It's it like banana size, even bigger. Look, it's like bigger than my head, right? And That's it has these amazing. like wicked serrations on it, just like a steak knife that it used to, to crush bones and tear flesh. This is huge, right? It's giant. What we don't know much about is Tyrannosaurus rex babies and Tyrannosaurus rex eggs or nests, how it reproduced. So I'm really hoping that the field work that we all do in 2021 this summer, somebody finds a nest of eggs of T-Rex or a very baby T-Rex. You know, <clears throat> I've joked, actually, we have a project uh, out in the Hell Creek Formation, the Ron Hell Creek Project, where we're going out and we're hoping to find a T-Rex um, for the museum. Um, but the one that I'm kind of hoping to bring back is kind of in a shoebox, because that would be the most important T-Rex we could find. Of course, everyone wants to find the big giant mm -hmm. one to put in the gallery. And those are, of course, spectacular. Um, and I think it would be pretty funny to, to come back to the museum one summer and say, we found a T-Rex. And they're like, oh, what are we going to have to do to collect it? And I'll be like, oh, it's right here. And uh, That's that would be scientifically probably one of, if not the most important T-Rexes that we could find a baby, because we just don't know much about their very early life stages. So that's what I'm hoping we find. Okay. Another thing I'd love to find about T-Rex yeah, is, sure. uh, yeah, is a skeleton with more skin. Okay. So much stuff here. I want to unpack some of those things really quick. But before we do sure. that, um, here's the gradient. Um, I'm so like into this conversation that I forgot we were doing an art project. Um, you can see how I did the rest of it here. I kept blending the, or the red into the orange, into the yellow, into the lighter yellow. And that's how you get sort of your sunset effect. After that, I cut up uh, some of my black uh, construction paper here so that I can glue on the bottom sort of the land that my dinosaur is gonna live on. Okay, sort of a hilly environment, that's where it lives. Um, and then what I'm doing on my black paper right here is I'm drawing my sauropod. I'm doing a long neck. We have a really big one at the ROM called a Barosaurus, which is really cool. We also have the yeah. Fulonchosaurus as well. But you can see I'm drawing it and I'm using um, a really light pencil to do that uh, so that it shows up on uh, the black construction paper. After that, I'm gonna cut it out. I'm gonna put maybe some ferns, some small shrubs, which are things that we learned existed with dinosaurs. I'm going to draw those on my paper and cut them out for my silhouettes. Um, very, very quickly, just on the topic of a T-Rex baby, and you maybe one day bringing like, that's what you bring home, which I think that'd would be, be so fun. Cool. Right here, I have a picture of a chicken, a baby chicken. Ooh. Okay. And so for our friends at home, this is a picture of a baby chicken. So cute, very cuddly. Um, have a lot of like cute energy happening right now. Would a baby T-Rex look like a baby chicken in the way that it would have like little feathers and it would be so cute and things like that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So this is another question that um, would, you know, needs fossils to answer more definitively. Um, we know that T-Rex's ancestors had like filamentous sort of hair-like or like kind of downy type feathers. Uh, and were pretty fuzzy. Uh, and because at smaller sizes, it's harder to retain your body heat, the idea would be that these hatchling T-Rexes, it would be advantageous for them to have some insulation, to have some, mm -hmm. to have some, uh, have some flat feathers. 
Um, there's also a debate as to just how feathery and how scaly T. rex was. There's been a few T. rex fossils that have been found that seem to show throughout patches of the body that T. rex actually may have lost its fur coat, its feathery, feathery coat um, in its evolution because it maybe got so big and actually became more it more important for it to to loot to lose heat than to keep it in as remember the world is a lot hotter than it is today and the bigger you are the hotter you get when you move around mm. and you don't want to overheat um but it had ancestors that had filamentous feathers so there's a big debate about was t-rex totally scaly was it sort of part feathered and part scaly when it was a baby was it feathered and then it lose those feathers uh as it uh, as it grew up um, these are all questions that need to be answered and a couple of nice mummified T-Rex specimens, I think would help to solve them in a very big way. So I'm hoping for that in 2021. Okay. That's, you used a word there that is really making my brain go off. Cause we talked about mummies on this show a few times. Um, and when it comes to like people, but what does a mummified T-Rex mean? Well, this is kind of a colloquial term and in the old days, uh, people thought that in order to get the skin or the feathers preserved on a dinosaur, the skin generally, that the animal had to dry out first uh, and then become buried. Um, but I, I think that was, I, I, most people don't think that anymore. I certainly don't. I think that uh, where you get the best skin preservation is where the animal is rapidly buried very quickly and you can get very nice skin preservation over the whole body in uh, situations where an animal basically dies in blood or beside a river gets scooped up in the water and buried uh, without having to dry out first. In fact, um, you know, when T-Rex lived and when Parasaurolophus lived, these are perennially really wet environments. It's like living in a swamp. Um, and these are, these are some of where some of the best dinosaur skin and mummies have been found like Zool, for instance, it would have been a perennially wet environment and we still got amazing skin preservation. So I don't think it, it doesn't refer to the fact that these things are dried out and desiccated like a Egyptian mummy. It just basically is a historic term that refers to the preservation of soft tissues all over the animal. Okay. So this leads us to another one of the things that we wanted to talk about, but I'm pretty sure Mylan asked as well about DNA. Can we find dinosaur DNA? And if so, would that be done by like finding it in soft tissue? Like, how does this all work? Yeah, so I mean, DNA is a soft tissue, right? <clears throat> it's the, the molecule that's, you know, that is basically the building plan for how we build the proteins that make up our body. It's very incredible. Um, and of course, you know, we all know about D DNA from Jurassic Park and whether we can recover DNA and, and build a dinosaur. Uh, from it. Uh, and DNA, it immediately starts to decay when an animal dies. And so, of course, in these warm, wet environments, these DNA, where dinosaurs live mostly, we're getting the fossils. Yeah, for sure, DNA would have been susceptible to decay. But the more we look for soft tissues, particularly proteins, um, the more that we're finding. And there was a very tantalizing study that came out last year uh, by my friend uh, Alita Baliu. Uh, and working in, uh, she's working in China now, and she looked at dinosaur cartilage cells, mm. and um, she found what really is suggestive of preserved DNA. Now they weren't sequenced, but it's tantalizing. And there's been a few examples of this. Another one, I believe, was in Brachylophosaurus, a duckbill by Mary Schweitzer. And so. I wouldn't say the more we look, the more we find, the more we're surprised by the level of preservation of these uh, biomolecules, these you know, molecules that make up our, our tissues and our body. And there are some tantalizing new discoveries that suggest, you know, maybe we will be able to get tiny little snippets. We're never going to get a complete code, but uh, it's still very, very exciting. We still might be able to use it to reconstruct the family tree of dinosaurs. We still might be able to look at how particular proteins like the like the keratins in our fingernails evolved and things like this and you know that would be a revolution in paleontology and we're just at the very start of it and maybe if I was going into paleontology again maybe I'd get into to to a molecular paleontology because it's a very very exciting field that's fascinating. that's that's fascinating we have we are we are covering so much today 
Thank you so much. We're gonna do three more questions um, because we, uh, we, we're, we're really motoring here. You can see I drew up all my little plants and then afterwards I can cut them out and then glue them onto my page. Um, just very sort of quickly on our point about like the Jurassic Park or, or DNA and like, could we bring things back? Um, I guess my question is, is we've talked about de-extinction before where we do bring animals back. Um, but I, I worry a little bit that if we spend all of our time trying to bring animals back, that we're not working on saving the animals that are here already. Yeah, oh, I agree. I mean, I think bringing animals back on the base of say DNA or that's collected from historic collections or something like that. You know, there's a big debate you can have about the, the, the value of that, but usually there's gaps in the genetic code that you have to fill in you have to get surrogates and there's like even a big debate as to whether you're actually bringing back you'll actually be bringing back this the original species or some sort of like frankenstein monster that we've created um and you know this is of course it's a very interesting work it uh, takes a lot of money and resources um, but I think that we'd be far better off putting that into conserving the biodiversity that we have living today, where there's no doubt it belongs where it is, and it's part of an unbroken genetic heritage um, and part of the diversity of life on the planet, and we should do everything we can to protect that. We shouldn't be relying on de-extinction after the fact. Love it. That's, that's something we talk about a lot on this show. Thank you for, for going in on that a little bit. Okay, final two questions. One very close to us. Uh, for those who don't know, David Evans is a massive Raptors fan. Uh, yeah. Toronto Raptors fan, NBA franchise, you know, what, 2019 world champions, the longest oh, reigning yeah. world champions in baseball, uh, basketball history. Um, so, it, you know, we got to talk a little bit about Raptors too. Obviously yep. made super famous in films like Jurassic Park. But I guess one of my questions is, like, were there Raptors in Canada? Like, what's going on there? Yeah, so again, I think that a lot of people would be surprised at how little we know about raptors. So they're one of the most famous groups of dinosaurs. Of course, Velociraptor uh, and to a lesser extent, Deinonychus are like some of you know the most iconic dinosaurs out there. Um, but uh, with you know a few small exceptions, we actually know very, very little about most raptor species. Uh, but we do know that they were around. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to work on the most complete uh, raptor skeleton found in Canada with my my childhood hero, Dr. Phil Curry. Um, some research that came out a little over a year ago was a complete um, Sornitholestes skeleton, uh, which is from the same rocks that produced our Parasaurolophus. They would live together. And it even, it was so well preserved um, we're still working on it. it has the 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 claw sheaths on the claws so soft tissue preservation it's got the animal's last meal and its stomach which we're working Whoa. on which is super cool and it also has um the fossilized poop in its digestive system that hasn't emerged yet whoa oh, the, that's yeah. so, so I, I never could it imagine is that a wild specimen um but uh, that taxon, Sornithlestes, was mostly known from just isolated bits and pieces, uh, some fragments of a, of a, of a, of a, of a skull, uh, some, a lot of teeth that have been isolated, and just individual bones. We didn't really know much about it at all. And after over 100 years looking, we got one really nice specimen, and it's the best raptor found in, yeah, in North America, I would say, bar none. Um, but all, a lot of these, you know, animals we still don't have complete full skeletons of. Akira Raptor, one of my favorite dinosaurs, the raptor that lived with T-Rex, a great ROM story named after Jim and Louise Temerty, who, who, who uh, funded our wonderful dinosaur gallery. We still only know a few bones from that dinosaur in isolated teeth. One of my New Year's resolutions would be, you know, hopefully scientists find a whole skeleton of, of Akira Raptor. Uh, another one that's pretty famous, Dromaeosaurus, which is the first Dromaeosaur raptor uh, ever found, found in Alberta, and again in the same rocks that produce our Parasaurolophus. We only have a partial skull and some bones from the, the feet and and, uh, and things like that. We don't know anything about it, really. Uh, so I'd love to see another specimen of that found. 
And then close raptor relatives, you could argue they're raptors, the truodontids. These are the brainy dinosaurs with the big brains. This is a cast of a jaw of a truodont. You can see the very distinctive teeth there with the really big serrations. Um, That's cool. For instance, the truodont from the time of T-Rex, one of the best sample time periods in, in terms of research effort, we only know teeth and maybe one or two bones. And so I'd love to find a complete pectinodon, which is the, the, is, is the name bearer of those teeth, but we really don't know what the truodon looked like um, that lived with T-Rex and Triceratops. So there's one of my New Year's resolutions. Let's find one of those. I like that. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up with our final question, which also relates to some of our questions in the group chat. Also, Noah, we're gonna get to you here as well, is, um, you know, this is the Royal Ontario Museum. We're in the province of Ontario in Canada. We're in Toronto. And something that I've always grown up with knowing is that while dinosaurs were found all over Canada, they're not found in Ontario because of our rock. Now, when we were getting ready to talk about the show, um, obviously it's been a while since you've been doing some field work because yeah. of the, the, the climate of the world over the, the last year. And so uh, one of the favorite parts of your work is to get out there into the field, into the world, and to find dinosaurs. And you might be going somewhere really interesting this year. Yeah, so because of the, the pandemic, we, can't, we haven't been able to travel. It was the first field season that I didn't actually get to go out and search for dinosaur fossils in 21 years. Wow. Um, so that was definitely sad, but you know we had to do it to keep the world healthy. Um, but uh, so people are staying close to home. And uh, one of the areas I'd really like to explore in 2021 uh, is the one spot up north of Capus Casey, Ontario, near James Bay in Northern Ontario, where we have the right rock of the right age that could produce a dinosaur. Whoa. And I went there about a year and a half ago and uh, did a one day helicopter reconnaissance because it's way in the Muskeg. You can't drive there, you can't hike there. Um, and I found um, this piece of fossil wood and we found a fossil forest with Whoa. big logs and big trees preserved in, in, in place, big stumps that, you know, could go up, go up to your hip. Uh, and uh, we found a lot of the right type of rocks, mudstones deposited on the banks of ancient rivers, sandstones from these river channels, exactly the type of rock um, that we find dinosaurs from in places like Alberta and Saskatchewan and the Arctic. So I'm very excited to go there. We're trying to work on getting an expedition set up for September of, of this year with my former student, Tom Cullen. Oh, um, yeah, and a, yeah, and a former, uh, a former technician here, Peter May, uh, our team to go up and uh, try to find Ontario's first dinosaur. That so, would be so cool. So, so no, there's no dinosaurs in Toronto uh, that we have found uh, because the rock is just too old. But somewhere else in Ontario, we might be finding um, That's our right. first dinosaur. So the, the rocks there are about 120 to 130 million years old. And from other places in North America, some pretty cool dinosaurs that are known from around that time. Deinonychus, you know, the raptor that inspired the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. um, there's Tenontosaurus and things that are similar to Iguanodon. And then there's some sauropods too. So even just a single tooth of any one of those types of dinosaurs would be, I would be over the moon. I grew up here coming to the ROM when I, from when I was just a few years old. And uh, I would love to be able to put the first dinosaur from Ontario in the halls of this great museum. So wish me luck. Ontario dinosaur in the Royal Ontario Museum. If anyone can do it, I think it's David Evans. Um, Today on the longest episode, but I think one of the most fun episodes of the Wrong Kid Show we've ever done with uh, our good friend, friend of the show, Dr. David Evans, uh, we made um, the silhouette dinosaur um, paintings. We learned about gradients. We learned about silhouettes, these sort of using an image, but then uh, just using the outline of it. Uh, we learned how to blend colors together. And then my goodness, did we learn a lot about dinosaur environments 
did we learn that there are no dinosaurs in Ontario currently because of the rock, but there is one place where there might be. Um, we learned a lot about dinosaur babies, that dinosaurs had cancer, and that while uh, de-extinction sounds really, really cool, we really want to protect the animals we have with us right now. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we're going to be back next week with our good friend um, Oliver Havrath where we're going to do a DNA experiment um, on some strawberries. Um, this episode will be up on YouTube later on the week. David, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Love talking to you and everybody out there, all the wrong kids about dinosaurs. My favorite thing to do. Oh, and it was so great to have you here. Everyone, uh, see you next Tuesday. Show us your art. Send it in. Uh, Kieran C. Mukherjee. Um, have so much fun. Stay safe. We love you. Wear a mask. Bye, everyone.